I'm glad that we're having this discussion about lipids in women and ASCVD in women because there are differences. You know, women are not smaller men or have unique risk factors. Even among traditional risk factors, diabetes and smoking confer a greater relative risk in women than in men. And then women have unique risk factors that we'll talk more about throughout their lifespan that men do not related to menarche when early or late and polycystic ovary syndrome and infertility, spontaneous pregnancy loss, parity, adverse pregnancy outcomes like preeclampsia, lack of breastfeeding and early menopause. In addition, you know, chronic inflammatory conditions like rheumatoid arthritis and lupus are more prevalent in women. So women have these unique risk factors that are female specific or female predominant. And cardiovascular disease also can be different in women, which is why we need more trials in women. You know, women are more likely to have ischemia with non-obstructive coronary disease from coronary microvascular dysfunction or coronary vasospasm. They're more likely to have SCAD, spontaneous coronary artery dissection, and more likely to have stress cardiomyopathy than men. So we really need more data about treating cardiovascular disease in women. But let's talk about the life cycle that you alluded to in the beginning with your question. Estradiol is the predominant female sex hormone in women of reproductive age that seems to have the beneficial effects with lowering LDL and conferring some cardiovascular protective properties. Um, But I should mention there's actually three types of estrogen. So estradiol, which is the predominant one in women in childbearing age, and this is the most potent form of estrogen. So estradiol is E2. So estriol E3 is the main estrogen produced during pregnancy. And then estrone E1 is the only estrogen produced after menopause. It's also the weakest estrogen. So, you know, starting with puberty, puberty is a process that starts in the brain. So the hypothalamus in the brain suddenly begins secreting gonadotropin releasing hormone or GnRH. FSH and LH levels gradually increase during puberty, which stimulate the follicle maturation and estrogen production in the ovaries, and also the secondary sex characteristics like breast changes and changes in body composition. This gets to the point where then there's the onset of menarche or the first menses. And so this is typically, you know, around age 12. And it's important to note that, you know, I treat adult patients, but why I even ask adult women about the onset of menarche is because both early menarche before the age of 11 and also late menarche after the age of 17 has been associated with increased cardiovascular disease risk later in life. And there's likely hormonal and adipokine and cardiometabolic imprinting that's related to this. There's lots of factors related to the onset of menarche, but both social economic and environmental factors, as well as genetic factors. But elevated BMI is a risk factor for early onset menarche, which is why, again, it's so important that we think about healthy lifestyles starting in childhood. And I'll talk a little bit now about the menstrual cycle because many people don't know, but the lipids do change throughout the menstrual cycle. Difference in little cholesterol, you know, as much as 10 to 12 milligrams per deciliter difference. And so while most women of reproductive age who have lower LDL, this is not probably clinically significant in terms of atherogenesis. It does matter when thinking about the timing of measuring a lipid panel during the menstrual cycle. I think that's important to note. So during the menstrual cycle, you have the hypothalamus is releasing GnRH, which causes the pituitary gland to release FSH. So FSH is acting on the ovaries to mature the follicles, and that the follicles of the ovaries is what secretes estradiol. And so estradiol causes the maturation of the egg and the thickening of the uterus lining in preparation for a fertilized egg implant. And then the increased estradiol triggers the release of LH, which induces ovulation and the release of the egg. And so ovulation ends the follicular phase. And then after ovulation, you're in the luteal phase where estradiol with progestin prepare the womb for implantation. But if the egg isn't fertilized, the corpus luteum which is secreting the progesterone, breaks down. So this leads to a drop in progesterone level in the beginning of the menstrual period. What does this mean for lipids? So after menses, you know, total cholesterol and LDL increase rapidly after menses. And so they really peak during this follicular phase. And then this is followed by a decline in the luteal phase 
which corresponds to the rise in the peak concentration of estrogen and progesterone. So when estradiol is the highest in the menstrual cycle, this leads to the fall in total cholesterol and LDL. HDL is highest around ovulation. Triglycerides didn't really have a consistent pattern during the menstrual cycle. So there isn't specific guidance. And sorry, just to make sure I understood that, Erin, the difference between the peak and nadir of LDL cholesterol is about 10 to 12 milligrams per deciliter, or is that total cholesterol? That was total cholesterol, but it mirrors the difference in LDL as well. So this was a study that um, published, so on average, total cholesterol may go from 158 to 168, where LDL on average went from 97 to 102. So, you know, they're not dramatic changes, which is why we don't worry about this too much in women of reproductive ages who don't have a lipid disorder. But it's, you know, interesting to note. But if a woman is very high risk, like has ASCVD, and we're trying to target these really intensive thresholds like LDLs less than 70 or even lower, it's useful to know that they do change throughout the menstrual cycle. So while there's no specific guidance around this, you know, I generally recommend clinicians measure the lipid panel during the menses um, so that it's ideally measured, monitored, and compared at the same time during the menstrual cycle. So usually the menses is easiest to benchmark too. We do that when we're concerned with, as women become perimenopausal and we want to start getting a sense of what's happening, we always use day five. So if the initiation of menses, even if it's spotting, is day one, but we always just pick day five. And that way we have a really consistent view specifically of FSH and estradiol. Progesterone is zero at that time. But the FSH and the estradiol really give us a sense of how close she's probably getting to menopause. And then we correlate that with symptoms to sort of start to think about initiating HRT. But that's a whole other topic, which I'm sure we'll get to. You know, in terms of lipid panel, it's good to be measuring around the same time each month. So if you're following the serial lipid panels in a woman for a reason, so timing it around day five, especially if you're measuring other hormones. But yeah, so FSH would be at the highest during the early follicular page and then declines after ovulation, where LH is low during the early follicular phase and then peaks around at ovulation, which stimulates the egg to be released. At this point in a woman's life, she still enjoys this, for all intents and purposes, decade advantage over men in terms of ASCVD risk. So a 40-year-old woman who is still ovulating is at a cardiovascular standpoint is a 30-year-old man. Is that directionally what we would say prior to menopause? Yeah, I mean, on average, and again, people are not averages, you know, people are individuals, but on average, there is a about 10 year offset of ASCVD in women developing it later than men. And this may be because as we'll talk about when we get to menopause, you know, with the loss of estradiol after menopause, LDL levels rise after menopause. And so that women may have higher LDLs a little bit later in life. You know, many women tell me, oh, you know, I've always had good lipid levels and now they're higher, you know, after menopause. And so when we get back to what we started with about the integration of duration of LDL exposure in terms of cholesterol years, they may have had lower number of cholesterol years during their childbearing years and then higher levels later in life. And that might be why they have this offset. But again, you don't see this in FH and we don't see this as well in diabetes. And so each person is an individual. And so we do women a disservice when we presume that all women somehow are lower risk or protected during their menopausal years. Because we started out this podcast talking about that we absolutely see myocardial events, not just things like SCAD, but we see actual atherosclerotic myocardial function events in younger women too. So they're at lower risk, but not zero risk. And so we take each person as an individual. And then there are things we need to consider related to contraceptions and PCOS that can also affect the lipid profile as well.